Kay is the director within the Patients in Partnership team at GlaxoSmithKline uh, Research and Development. Uh, she is there the patient engagement lead uh, since uh, January 2017 and is in fact really working very hard on making her own company believing into the value of patient engagement and helping the different departments to find patients, to find a way to talk with them, to get the best input, but also on the other hand, to enable patients to really meaningfully contribute to this. And uh, she's going to tell you where we stand on that. Thank you, Ingrid, for that kind introduction. So I'm actually presenting on behalf of you, Patty, today, as you'll see from my slides. But as Ingrid has mentioned, I've been a patient engagement lead at GSK now for 10 years. So I have got a lot of experience in this field. And I'm delighted to say I've met a lot of very different patients with very different experiences, some good, some bad. Um, lots of patient advocates I've worked with as well and caregivers in addition. So I'm going to speak about um, Yupati's guidance documents on the interaction with patients um, today. So as, as Ingrid had outlined in her introduction, better therapies can only happen with four patients and it requires that interaction of all these stakeholders as you see on the graph here. And patient um, involvement in R&D, it needs to have all those stakeholders around the table, you know, including the patient. It's acknowledged, as Ingrid has said, that patients' contribution to the discovery, development and evaluation of medicines really enriches the whole process. So the quality of the research and development, the quality of evidence and the transparency, trust and mutual respect in terms of the ethical procedures. Close cooperation and partnership between various stakeholders is absolutely necessary, in my opinion. Um, the pharmaceutical industry, the health regulatory authorities, um, technology assessments, um, ethics committees, I mean, the list goes on. Um, in 2015, there was a call for more action on system, uh, systematic patient involvement um, and a paper that was written by um, a collaboration of different pharma companies and patient organisations. Um, so I would um, recommend that you go and read the call for action. Um, the, the data is here on the screen. So I just, just wanted to mention that as reference. And within UPATI, we have a, a roadmap for patient involvement. So as you see on the screen here, we really try to map out what patient in involvement looks like across the whole medicines uh, R&D life cycle and what the patients could actually do in, in terms of providing that input, which we feel is very valuable across the whole life cycle. For me personally, within GSK, I'm trying to get the, the R&D scientists more involved, the patients more involved in the, in the early sections of the process. I mean, we're talking here today about clinical research. Yes, that's very important, but actually getting the patient voice in as early as possible is fundamental to move forward. So patient input encompasses very different types and experience levels and what Upati has done is really try to define what we term as patient. I'm not going to read through all this on the screen, you can all read, but as essentially we're looking at you know, different patients, so individual patients, what I call grassroots patients who may not be a member of a patient organisation. Carers, they give very different perspectives um, to patients. Many times I've experienced that when I've spoken to to patients, they understand their disease, but they've moved on from diagnosis. They're now de dealing with the here and now, whereas carers can actually think back and remember some very pertinent points that the patient has kind of not forgotten, but moved on from. Um, I think that's really important in some diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, etc., And obviously children. Let's not forget their uh, children here. Um, patient advocates are, again, you know, important people that we should be engaging with. They speak on behalf of thousands, millions of patients in ca some cases. So we need to make sure we involve them in the process. Patient organisation representatives as well speak on behalf of large communities and patient experts, people who have you know, many, many years of experience of engaging with um, the industry, with the communities, etc., can bring that voice as well. And patient experts, particularly for the UPATI context, is where they have been trained in the medicines R&D process and understand the language, the terminology, the process. Interactions with patients on R&D still has lots of challenges. You know, it's not by any means solved. Um, there's a, a, an aspect here of, you know, we're cultivating our own garden. You know, we do, we're working in silos. We're not sharing um, details. We're not sharing learnings or challenges to move together as an industry, and we need to change that. 
There is a lack of standardised metrics on how to you know, measure the benefits of patient involvement. I'm sold on that. I don't think we need to ver measure very much, but lots of different companies are saying different things. So we need to come to some consensus there. There's a lack of trust amongst different stakeholders that we really need to break down some of those barriers. Um, and there's lack of ca capacity in patient organisations as well. They're still coming up to speed with this whole idea of patient involvement in R&D, and we really need to help them move forward with that. So to, to get to the, the guidance documents I'm going to mention in a moment, UPATI held two workshops in July 2014 and l recently last year to really try and understand the myths, the challenges, and, and try and get to some solutions to really help us understand the, the landscape as it is um, in, those, in those two years throughout the UPATI project, which ran for five years. So we really had a really good understanding from different stakeholders, from, from patient groups, from patients, uh, from um, industry, from academia, and from regulators as well in our second workshop. And as it says here, you know, we try to encourage you know, earlier patient involvement in R&D, try and share views and experience and learnings to help ensure that we have that interaction and it's understood, respected and trusted to break down some of the issues that I mentioned in an earlier slide, to discuss progress on evaluation and evolution of industry processes. There were 30 case studies that we identified as part of these workshops before that, there were, were very many, weren't very many case studies published um, in literature out there in, in the public domain. It was very hard to find examples of patient involvement. We actually demystified some of the perceived barriers as well that we found that were identified by many of the stakeholders. Actually, some of them don't really exist. Um, legal and, and pro processual um, barriers really can be overcome. And some companies have actually gone through that, that barrier anyway. And we merged industry and regulators' discussions, as I mentioned earlier, to really speak about the guidance for interaction and the conflicts of interest that do occur. So the UPATI guidance documents, yeah, why do we need guidance documents? Patients and patient organisations have to be involved more widely, as I've outlined earlier, but to include early and post-approval stages and not be confined just to clinical research. Overarching guidance on meaningful and ethical interaction is actually missing in many areas. There's lots of code of conducts out there that we reviewed as part of our guidance development, but they don't cover patient involvement in research and development. They simply don't mention it at all. So we really want to try and break down that barrier so that people going to the codes would see that they actually you can involve patients, you should be involving patients, and actually UPATI helps to guide us in that, in that direction. Uh, the language as well needs to be more directive towards patient involvement. We need a clear default statement that collaboration is allowed unless expressly forbidden, and UPATI's worked some way to achieving that. So the UPATI guidance documents are actually four guidance documents. As you can see listed here, there's documents in uh, industry-led R&D, in HTA, health technology assessment, in regulatory processes, in ethics committees. Um, as it's mentioned here, that we've had extensive um, public consultation, but prior to that, internally within the UPATI consortium, which is made up of 33 partners, we had great um, lengthy de deliberations about what to include in the guidances, what to exclude, how detailed to get, um, you know, what we wanted to make sure was covered in, in, good, um, in good detail. And from there, we've developed you know, four really good drafts that we put out to public consultation, which ended in September 2016. And we published in December 2016 on the upati.eu website. So if you go onto the website, you'll be able to find the guidance documents. So I'm going to specifically focus on the industry-led R&D um, guidance document. So really we wanted to try and identify specific instances of interactions to explore synergies in how to create roles for patients in R&D in a really systematic way. There's some great work going on, but it's very ad hoc. It's, it's piecemeal. There's, there's um, interactions that happen you know, occasionally. We want to see long-term partnerships being um, built up over a considerable amount of time. We do recognize that ad hoc um, interactions will start those long-term partnerships. 
We have guidance. The guidance covers you know, defining the patient, which I've mentioned in an earlier slide, the operating procedures, again, to the long-term interaction. We're really pushing for that. The operating principles, how you would go about you know, identifying patients, how you would go about you know, setting up that interaction, the methods for interaction, defining the interaction, what it actually looks like. Patients want to know that. They want to know what they're committing to, what their expectations are, what you know, the community um, expectations are as well, and the stakeholder in, uh, expectations. The, the ways and means for identification of patients for the interaction as well. The guidance documents covers key elements of a written collaboration agreement because obviously you need consent, you need a release, you need to explain data privacy, confidentiality. Uh, the rules of compensation is really important. We are recommending that patients are paid for their time and obviously their travel expenses are reimbursed. But in most cases, we're identifying that patients' travel should be booked by the stakeholders in advance and paid so that the um, patients are not out of pocket for that travel or for that expense. Uh, we cover events and hospitality. There are issues where patients have gone to different conferences and not been able to um, actually interact or go into summer halls because they've been um, disallowed from those um, scientific um, presentations. I think that's changing, but it's a slow change. Um, and then transparency and disclosure obviously is very important as well. And within um, the appendices, we have the roadmap, which I showed earlier on, on the slide, and uh, some of the codes of conduct, uh, code of practices that we actually reviewed. I think a total of about 40 in the end that we, we actually looked through before we wrote the guidance document. So I wanted, well, I was asked to actually develop and, and provide some um, examples for this presentation today. Um, so, you know, given my 10 years' experience in the field, I've got three case studies from GSK to share with you today. And, and very simply, um, there was um, a, a project that was set up to review a, a draft plain language summary uh, from a completed phase three study in COPD. Um, GSK is getting geared up to obviously um, release all the um, patient um, uh, all the results from their clinical studies as part of the EU um, legislation that's coming in. But we really wanted to make sure that our plain language summaries were written with patients in mind, that they could be understandable um, beyond, you know, obviously the, the physical results from studies. And patients provided really valuable feedback on that draft summary, not only about the wording, which you would expect, but also the structure of the document, you know, how the content of the plain language summary should be delivered. And further questions about, you know, how can I learn from the study results? What do I need to take forward? Some of those things we won't be able to include in the, in the summary, but it's, it's food for thought for future uh, management of clinical study results. And in terms of learnings, in terms of the method of interaction, it's got to be key. You know, you've really got to consider how you involve patients because some of them can't travel. Some of them don't have Skype. Some of them want to do a telephone conference. Some people want to travel and do an in-person interview or have an in-person discussion. Some people are really key in terms of having like patient group, um, focus group discussions rather than one-on-one. -on -one. So you've got to build that into your plans. Um, there are different skills and perspectives and there's different levels of expertise and knowledge. You need to remember that when engaging patients. But everyone brings something different to the table and actually there's no silly question at the end of the day. I think you know, patients coming into this perhaps new or you know, have recently been trained still have really valuable questions that they can raise. And it really provokes an in-depth discussion um, in terms of the interaction. You, know, you, you go in with set questions but actually come out with a really valuable discussion at the end of it. Um, similar points we, you know, with common themes, you know, there's a wide range of suggestions for overall improvement, as I mentioned earlier. And you're going beyond insight shared. You're, you're considering how patients might retain and seek information in the future. The second case study was an early collaboration in R&D between patients uh, with psoriasis and a, a, a patient who um, was representing the Psoriasis Association. And really here we wanted to understand the impact of psoriasis on the lives of patients with their, from their own views. You know, we, we have a lot of information in literature, but we really wanted to hear from the patient about their experience. And this was really to direct our, our future clinical study endpoints. So this is why the discussion was, was happening. Um, the learnings here in terms of the engagement itself was to allow more time for outreach, 
Um, we found that with psoriasis patients, psoriasis patients, they tend to hide away. Um, you know, they, they don't want to be coming out and talking about psoriasis in the open field. You know, it's, it's a difficult disease to understand for them and for us. And you really have to understand that it will take longer to identify patients who want to speak openly about their experience. Um, greater emphasis on opportunity for patients and patient organisations to work with industry and the benefits this can bring. You've really got to sometimes sell to patients that, you know, this is an experience, it's a new thing in some cases, in some diseases, but really having that conversation is key and you can really build on that. Um, patients wanted to know how they'd helped. So from, from sort of the four, last four years, I've been actually developing um, case study reports of our interactions with patients, providing feedback to patients on how their experience, their words, their insights were used within the company. You know, I think it's really important to make sure they understand that in some cases we weren't able to take their, ex their suggestions in the case of the plain language summary. In same, some cases we were actually able to um, take forward their suggestions. And the third case study was around um, study design into cutaneous lupus. GSK has a lot of experience in lupus, but we really didn't understand the skin involvement of the disease. So we really here in early um, research into this disease, a new disease area for GSK, wanted to talk to patients about their experience with the illness, you know, beyond the, the lupus um, involvement. So we provided travel support for the patients because many of the patients came from, uh, from Europe and not just from the UK, although the conversation was held in Cambridge. Um, we found that patients, and in many cases I find this, patients want to help others. So they're sharing their experience, their knowledge to help further research, but to help other patients in the future. Um, it's, it's apparent to us that the disease impact is broad. You know, it's not just um, you know, UV light, but there's more going on. You know, patients are actually asking us, could we provide not only um, a, a cream um, that could be applied to the skin, but actually think about a sunscreen application within that cream as well, so they're not having to apply two uh, uh, creams on their skin. Um, there was a good understanding of the importance of research by the patients that we spoke to. Um, so I, th I see that growing as an area of, of knowledge within the patient community. You know, and I'm not just talking about David, but you know, other people in the field that are actually getting more involved in, in this discussion. Um, information that patients shared really helped the researchers to progress with designing a clinical trial, trial. And I think that's really important for the audience here today to understand that talking to patients as early as you can before you design your clinical trial is really important and will set you off on a really good platform. So I've, I've whizzed through that and hopefully we'll have some questions and um, thank you for listening.